I'm Michael Lacewing. I was Vice Principal Academic at Heathrop College, University of London, and I'm now Head of Theology and Philosophy at Christ Hospital School in Sussex. I'll be talking about where our knowledge comes from, and in particular, whether all of our knowledge comes from experience. <laughs> that it does is probably associated most with science and is very popularly held today. After all, science uses our experience in order to discover um, the facts which it discovers about the world. And the interest of this question is if that's the only way that we can know about the world. Does all of our knowledge of the world depend upon our experience of it? Or do we have other ways of knowing about the world? The view that, in fact, all our knowledge does come from sense experience is associated with the philosophical school of the British empiricists writing in the 17th and 18th centuries at the rise of the scientific revolution. So John Locke, George Berkeley and David Hume all argued that all our knowledge does indeed derive from our experience. Locke famously says, Let us then suppose the mind to have no ideas in it, at birth that is, to be, as we say, white paper with nothing written on it. This is his famous tabula rasa or blank slate theory of the mind. He goes on, all the materials of reason and knowledge are acquired from experience. Opposing this view is the view that we have innate knowledge, knowledge which has not been gained from sense experience but is somehow built into the structure of the mind. As Locke describes it, innate knowledge involves notions, ideas, stamped upon the mind of man, which the soul receives in its very first being and brings into the world with it. In fact, many people have opposed the idea of all of our knowledge coming from sense experience, and innate knowledge was the standard view of most philosophers and theologians and thinking people um, up until the scientific revolution. So let's start by seeing what can be said on their side. Plato defended innate knowledge, and he famously did so through an example, in which Socrates, who's operating as Plato's mouthpiece in a dialogue called the Meno, has a discussion with a slave boy of Meno, a nobleman. And he's trying to demonstrate that there are things that we know which we can't learn or haven't learned from experience. So he asks the slave boy to see if he can solve a problem in geometry, which the slave boy hasn't been taught, though he understands basic arithmetic. So Socrates draws a square on the ground in front of them, two foot by two foot, and he asks the boy, what is the area of this square? And the boy answers, four square feet. So Socrates said, so if we had a square with, which was eight square feet in area, how long would each side be? Now at first, the boy simply doubles the length of the sides, and he says there'd be four feet. But of course, four feet by four feet gives you a square of 16 square feet. The boy quickly recognises this is wrong, so he tries the number between 2 and 4, and he answers 3. But again, he realises that this is wrong, because a 3 foot by 3 foot square has an area of 9 square feet. Well, he doesn't know any numbers between 2 and 3, so he's a bit stumped. Socrates then scrawls a bit more on the ground in front, drawing three more squares, each 2 foot by 2 foot, adjoining the first square forming one large square of four foot by four foot, divided into four quadrants. He then draws a diagonal line across the original square, and he asks the slave boy, each of these triangles in this original square, what's the area within them? And the boy easily identifies that it would be two square feet, half the size of the original square. Socrates then draws three more diagonals, together enclosing a diamond space in the middle of the larger square. So he asked the boy, so four of these triangles, each of two square feet, would give you how many square feet? And the boy realises that this indeed is a square with an area of eight square feet. So the length of a side of a square with eight square feet is equal to the diagonal of the square which was two foot by two foot. So Plato's point in using this example is to say that because the slave boy was only asked questions by Socrates, the knowledge which he gained was not gained from his experience. It was not taught to him by Socrates. And this is the most important argument for innate knowledge. The argument is that we have innate knowledge because we have knowledge which we cannot have learned from experience. 
And this is precisely what the example of the slave boy's discovery is supposed to show. Now, as I said earlier, the view that there was innate knowledge was popular from the time of Plato's writing until Locke challenged this view in the 17th century. Locke provides a number of arguments for rejecting the idea that there is innate knowledge, but perhaps one of the ones that he places the most weight on is this one here. He wants to say, to start with the idea of that knowledge is conscious in the mind. He thinks it doesn't make sense to think that the mind is not transparent to itself, that it cannot be aware of its own ideas. To have an idea which is yours, which you're not aware of, he says, makes no sense. So knowledge is, or of course at some point something we may have forgotten, was in the past conscious to us. Innate knowledge would have to be universal, he goes on, because what is innate is given to all human beings. After all, it's supposed to be built into the structure of the mind, and there's no difference between our minds at the point of birth. So innate knowledge is universal. But he argues, there is no knowledge which all human beings have been conscious of. For example, very young children or people with severe learning disabilities simply cannot know or understand the geometrical proof that Plato provided um, in his dialogue. So because there's no knowledge which all human beings have been conscious of, and that's precisely what innate knowledge would have to be, this shows that there can be no innate knowledge. Now coming to Plato's defense was Gottfried Leibniz, a generation after Locke, and he responded to Locke's argument by tackling his premises. While Locke claimed that all knowledge had to be conscious, Leibniz disagrees. We can know things without being conscious of them. Innate knowledge is not something which babies are conscious of at birth. Rather, he has the idea that innate knowledge exists as a disposition, an aptitude, a preformation in the mind towards developing, understanding and knowing certain thoughts. So it's like our minds are on a track to see the truth of certain thoughts when they occur to them. And that's the form that innate knowledge takes while it is unconscious. He gives us the metaphor of a block of marble. Think of the mind as a block of marble, and inside that block of marble there are veins running through the marble. They're already there, but we can't see them. Instead, they can be revealed by the sculptor, here playing the role of experience. So as the mind interacts with experience, the veins of marble, which were already within that block of marble, come to be revealed. And so they come onto the surface of the block of marble, which is consciousness. And this is what happens with innate knowledge. We discover the innate knowledge within our minds as a product of the interaction of the mind with the experience. But the innate knowledge was there all along. Well, it's an illuminating metaphor, but why think that it's true? Leibniz offers us two arguments. The first argument is that we need certain innate knowledge in order to be able to learn from experience, that without knowing some truths of logic already in an unconscious way, there's no way we could learn from our sense experience. Take for example the claim that it's impossible for something, the same thing to be and not to be. Now you can take this to mean either that it's something can't both exist and not exist at one and the same time, or that it can't have a certain property and lack that very property. For example, a ball that's black cannot also at the same time be not black. Things which are not black are not black, and things which are black cannot at the same time be not black. They are opposites and they can't be both at once. A ball which is a sphere can't be a cube because to be a sphere and not a sphere, which is what a cube is, can't happen at the same time. So here's a very fundamental principle of logic. Now we couldn't learn the meaning of the term black if we thought that we could apply it both to things which are black and to things which are not black. And so our being able to label something as black depends on our understanding that black things cannot be not black at the same time, and not black things cannot be black and the same with any other pair of properties. Leibniz's second argument is that there are certain truths which we simply cannot learn from experience. And here he's echoing Plato's original argument. So our sense experience tells us how things are, but not how things have to be. When you look out of your window, you might see a tree and a lawn or a bit of hedge, 
But it didn't have to be like that. The tree could be cut down, the lawn could be paved over. Things could well be different. And there's nothing from your sense experience that tells you that the arrangement of things as you see them in the world now is how things have to be. Quite the opposite. We think that the world constantly changes in that way. Secondly, when you look at the world, what you experience is something individual. It's how things happen to be at this moment, this particular tree, this particular lawn. You can't form a strictly general truth from that. Yes, you could generalize trees tend to have leaves that are green, but you can't know from experience that all tree has, trees have green leaves let alone that all trees must have green leaves. Unless, of course, you could somehow see all trees past, present and future. But still, the possibility of an exception, some trees might have red leaves, and indeed they do, nevertheless remains a possibility, for all sense experience knows. But truths which come from logic or from mathematics are not like that. They don't accept exceptions. So, for example, 2 plus 2 is 4 is not a generalization from our experiences of putting two objects and two objects together and getting four. Rather, two plus two is always four, and it must be four. It's a different kind of truth. It's called a necessary truth. So from these premises, Leibniz argues that necessary truths cannot be known from sense experience. So if they can't be known from experience, they must have a different origin. And he goes on to argue that we discover such truths of logic and mathematics by reflecting upon what is already in our minds, those veins running through the marble. I leave you with three questions about the exchange between Locke and Leibniz about the possibility of innate knowledge. The first is, can we meet the challenge that Leibniz has given to empiricism? Are the rules of logic and mathematics just rules that we have invented? Do they work more like definitions? And that's why they have to be true and in all, all cases. Is it not because they are a type of knowledge which we've discovered from something innate within us, but rather a series of rules, definitions which we have invented? The second, is whether other kinds of knowledge could be innate. Both Plato and Leibniz work with mathematics and logic. But of course, what about moral knowledge, for example? Well, in the late 20th century, the philosopher and linguist Noam Chomsky argued that we have innate knowledge of the rules of grammar. And the philosopher Peter Carruthers has argued that we come into the world with an innate knowledge of its basic structure, that there will be physical objects that exist independent of our minds in space and that other people will have minds, beliefs and desires. And he thinks that this is something which has been given to us through evolution. And that takes us to our final question. If innate knowledge doesn't come from experience, where does it come from? Well, Plato thought that it came from previous uh, existence in a purely intellectual or spiritual realm. Leibniz thought that it was given to, God, given to us by God, our creator. But Carruthers offers a scientific answer that it's the result of evolutionary selection. And so science, which initially seemed to support the view that all of our knowledge comes from sense experience, has in the last 40 or 50 years come more and more to support the view that in fact, we do have innate knowledge after all. Mm -hmm.